We've all worked with good engineering managers, bad engineering managers, and everything's in between. I have spent more than 15 years in this industry, and I have worked in startups, enterprises, and big tech, and I've pretty much seen it all. So this video is my breakdown of the nine characteristics of what constitutes great engineering managers, directors, or leaders in general. This is discussed from my vantage point as a software engineer, and this take is gonna be quite controversial because it's different from what generally goes around LinkedIn and other networks. In this topic in particular, there's a lot of cargo culting and there's a lot of, you know, shared opinions and thoughts and a very diplomatically correct way. In my humble opinion, great leadership is not about care and kindness and protection. These are important, but these are not the essence of it. There's nothing worse than a kind leader who has no clue what's happening or how to navigate the work environment. This is like following a shepherd to the slaughterhouse while being showered with kindness. I don't need to be protected from anything. I want to be able to do the work that I excel at. That's what I've been hired for. And I want to have access to all the information so that I can determine what is necessary for my objectives. I don't want to be spoon-fed requirements. I don't want to extract insights from third or fourth degree communication. I want to work with the leaders who understand that their primary objective is to help the builders like me be as productive as possible. This is how great software is shipped. And for that, they need the following. Number one, absolute clarity and a bold vision. There's nothing worse than working with a manager who basically floats in whichever direction the wind blows. They only care about their career and they only care about satisfying whoever helps them retain their career and benefits and whatnot. They have no clarity over anything. They do not make any decisions. They just simply funnel information and they have no vision for where they are going, which direction they're taking the team or their organization. They don't have any opinion about you know, the product or where wherever we're going, they just simply follow orders. Great managers, on the other hand, they know when to adapt and they know when to stand their ground. Sometimes very concrete and hard decisions need to be made. Sometimes managers need to manage upwards as opposed to being told what to do. And sometimes you need to fight back on certain things because you have information that allows you to determine with much more confidence that a certain direction is the right way to go. And a good manager is able to do that. Great managers are also willing to make bets and they are willing to deal with the consequences of the failed ones. If you don't take any risk, nothing substantial is going to change because big decisions require some level of uncertainty and not everything can be fully de-risked. Number two, great managers take accountability. Their success is the team's success and their team's failure is their failure. There's nothing worse than a leader who steals the credit of others and shifts the blame externally when initiatives fail and some initiatives are bound to fail. Number three, a technical background is a must, but that manager has to fight the urge to dive in all the time with their team. A technical background is something controversial and a lot of people who are gonna disagree with this most often don't have a technical background. And in my opinion, it is fundamental to leading engineering teams. Otherwise, the manager will be at the mercy of their most vocal and loudest team member. Being loud and being correct are not the same thing. And if you are not able as a manager to discern what is bullshit and what is, uh, you know, fact, you're going to have a very tough time and you're going to be managed by some of your, you know, strongest opinions on the team, but they are not necessarily the most correct. As for fighting the urge to dive in, it's very easy as a manager to always feel like the solution is within your hands. And if your team is not capable of uh, figuring, figuring it out for themselves, you feel like you have to jump in and save the day. You need to stop doing that at all costs. And I'm going to explain why in another point. Number four, radical candor. Give feedback in real time. Be as transparent as possible. And real time does not necessarily mean you put someone in the spotlight and you attack them, but it also means that you reduce the period of time that, is, that spans between the moment something happens and the moment you give feedback on it. Two, be very specific and actionable when you give that said feedback. You have to have concrete examples. You have to tell that person exactly what went wrong and how they can improve. And also you have to balance your praise with the criticism. You don't always give too much praise and you don't always give only criticism. You have to figure out the push and pull and this is more of an art than it is a science. And also make it a two-way conversation. Every time you give feedback, open up the floor for the other person to give their perspective, to share their thoughts and to give feedback back to you so that you know you can find common ground and you can actually 
align on that uh, feedback that is being provided as opposed to you passing judgment to that other person. Number five, be a great listener, but also decisive and assertive after. I've seen a lot of managers being great listeners, opening up the floor for every single opinion on the team, and then nothing happens. Why? Because no one was able to make a decision, no one was able to make a call on anything, and there's a lot of disagreement amongst the team. Listening does not mean letting the team run without constraints. It also doesn't mean listening until consensus is reached. The worst way to build software is by consensus. And if you grab 10 developers from across the globe, I bet you, no matter how much you randomize it, give them five topics and they will not agree on a single one. Great leaders need to collect input from everyone, and if the group is not able to make a decision forward, they have to make it. Number six, great leaders only commit to what they can influence or execute on. There's nothing worse than a leader who makes promises and never fulfills them. There's nothing worse than a leader who promises change of what is not within their control. This is absolutely not the time to fake it until you make it. Number seven, great leaders have a sort of a laissez-faire attitude and are accepting of some level of failure as a prerequisite for learning. Learning doesn't happen through training and courses only. Learning often happens through trial and error. Good leaders need to make this space or create the safe space so that failure can happen they need to have a large tolerance for failure and they need to let people learn from their own mistakes. Yes, you can provide feedback. Yes, you can pair people together. Yes, you can try to de-risk initiatives as much as possible, but also people have to fail. Otherwise, they're not gonna learn the lessons they're supposed to learn. And this is how you grow them. And by growing them, you're gonna reap bigger rewards. Number eight, great leaders develop partnerships upwards, downwards, and amongst their peers. They don't collect subordinates and try to build empires. Great leaders are not interested in vanity metrics. Great leaders know that substantially large teams also mean high communication and management overhead. Overhead that does not necessarily lead to higher efficiency. And finally, great leaders inspire. They don't do that by flaunting their wealth or any empty theatrics or other antics, but they do it with their action. They represent what others strive to become, and they are who others look up to. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to be said about this topic. I personally do not necessarily fulfill all of these different characteristics, but I strive as much as possible in order to be able to do that. Uh, obviously, a lot of constraints limit sometimes what you can achieve in a certain environment or in a certain workplace, but that shouldn't mean that you need to restrict yourself, accept the reality, and not try to achieve greatness. This is it for this video. I hope you learned something new, and I will catch you next time.